Thanks, Emily. Um, you can let me know if I sound okay audio-wise. Yep, you sound good. Great. So I'm Erica. I'm at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, but most recently before this at the Chicago Academy of Sciences, which is a member of Arctos. Uh, so how we're going to do things today is that Andy and I are going to split this time, and we're going to share a couple tools that are useful for cleaning data prior to mi migrating it into Arctos. So OpenRefine is what I'll be talking about, and then Andy is going to talk about some complementary data cleaning tools that are directly in Arctos. And I also wanted to note before we begin that in our webinar announcement, we said we would talk about Curator. We won't have time to do that today, but in the chat, I just put a link to a really great webinar that John Wachorek gave on Curator in October. So if you're interested in that, you can check out the link there. But let's get started. So OpenRefine is open source software, runs in your browser, but it's hosted locally. And what it's really helpful helpful for is it's, it's helpful to visualize data issues and, and to clean data program, programmatically, um, but in a more intuitive interface than you would with scripting through R or SQL. So it's basically like a powerful, more powerful than a spreadsheet, but more interaction than scripting, more provisional and experimental than a database. So it really is a helpful tool. And I like to think of I explain it to people is if you can describe what you want to do in a pattern, like you want you want someone to check if all these species names are valid, or you want to have a county for each of those localities. Refine is really good at helping you do tasks that are pattern based. So today we are going to work with a spreadsheet of salvage bird data that Andy needs to accession into the Denver Museum collection. So you can see here, the spreadsheet is already pretty clean. The headers are already the, the header names that Arctos needs to be able to migrate things. But we're going to take a look at it in OpenRefine, and I'll show you a couple of things that it can help you with data cleaning wise. So you'll notice that I opened Refine just on my applications on my computer, but it's going to open a tab in my browser. So it's not running on the internet. You can be editing data that you don't want public, and it's not publicly available or online anywhere. It's just using the browser as a user interface. So OK, I'm going to create a project from that spreadsheet I just showed you. So I'll choose some files. Oh, one other thing. You, if you are having trouble reading what's on my screen, tell Emily or, or put it in the chat somewhere, and she can tell me so that I'll make it bigger. OK, so we're opening that spreadsheet. And you'll notice here that Refine can deal with a lot of different kinds of data. Um, I'm going to make this a little smaller so you can see what's going on here, but it's giving me a preview of how it's going to read my data, and this all looks good. So I'm going to create a project. And you'll notice we have 149 rows, and we have all of our columns. They look much like they did in the spreadsheet. This is a pretty, it's an interface that we're all familiar with. A couple of cool things you can do in Refine are if you want to, you can easily reorder your columns just by clicking and dragging. That's kind of nice. We are going to start out by looking at some agent names. So Andy and I are focusing on cleaning agent names, geography, and taxonomy. And I'm just going to hide all of the stuff that we don't really care about so that we can, because my screen is pretty small already, so I need to be able to see. These are offset a little bit. That's fine. You can tell here that we've got this collector agent 1 field, collector agent 2, collector agent 3. One thing I can do is I can do a, a text filter or a text facet. So Refine, um, one of the ways it helps you visualize is through these filters and facets. So if I do a text facet, 
what it's showing me is it's showing me all the unique values in this collector agent one column and a frequency count. I can sort it alphabetically. I can sort it by frequency. I can see all the choices of text here. So I can also find names that are, you know, they're a little bit different in terms of how they're spelled or written, but they're the, they're the same person. I can do that by using the cluster tool. And so right away I see that, you know, Jeffrey T. Stevenson with or without a period is still the same, same guy. And I don't know what's going on with this dash or hyphen here, but this is probably the same person too. So what I can, oh no. Mm, well, weird here being at 150%. Give me a sec, we'll get back. What I can basically do is I can, when I cluster values, I can merge those and then have just one Jeffrey T. Stevenson um, instead of two. So that's helpful because Arctos is, is super precise. And if you put an agent into Arctos um, that Arctos couldn't find, it wouldn't know that you just forgot the period. OK, let's try this again. Uh, so we're going to merge those, merge those. And now you can see we only have 71 choices. So we, we got down a few um, options. We also can clean up things like extra spaces. Sometimes when people are typing, they'll automatically add a space. So if you go edit cells, common transformations, and trim leading and trailing white space, that'll get rid of those extra spaces. You can see two cells were fixed that way. The other thing that I like to notice when I'm, when I'm looking at collector names is oftentimes we have abbreviations in our data. So like here, we have RJC. If you put that into Arctos, it's going to be pretty meaningless because nobody knows who RJC is. But in the context of this data, we probably can figure it out. Uh, you can probably figure it out because you see Robert J. Clemens right beneath. But I'm going to show you if you had a bigger data set, you could use a text filter. And you could say, I want everything that starts with, that's what this caret means, starts with R. And I'm looking at all these names, and I see that Robert J. Clemens and RJC, I'm pretty sure those could be the same, or I'm pretty sure they are the same person. So I'll copy that, and I can edit directly within this text facet. And that's a way to improve the quality of your data before it gets to the stage of Arctos. OK, I'm going to clear these. And one thing that Arctos requires is for every collector agent column, you need to have a paired collector role column. We don't have that yet. So I'm going to make one. I'm going to do a facet by blank here. And what that's going to tell me is all of these false rows um, have values. All of these true rows are blank. I want that because I don't want to add a value for collector role when there's no collector. So I can create a new column by doing edit column, add column based on this column. I'm going to call it collector roll one, one. And if I just leave this as value, it'll duplicate the value from the original column. So I actually just want everything to be collector. I'll do OK. And now what I have is for each of the 140 rows that have a collector agent, they also have a role. And for the ones that were blank, there's no role. So that's the tip of the iceberg, but a brief overview of what you can do cleaning agent names. We're going to look next at geography. And we're moving through all of this quickly. But I'm going to give you a couple links at the end for resources that you can use to to learn more about OpenRefine, and you can always ask questions later. I'm going to hide a bunch of stuff, too. So Arctos needs to have higher geography for any locality. So Lakewood, where is that? Arctos needs to know the country and the state and the county. And maybe you just got a bunch of salvage data, and the collectors didn't record that. That's not a problem, because OpenRefine is really useful for querying web services to pull in information. So basically, if you know that this information exists on the internet somewhere, there's probably a web service that can help you match it up to the data that you have in your collection. So what we're going to do 
is we're going to edit column, we're going to again add column based on this column, but this time by fetching URLs. So what we want to do is we want to fetch a web service from Google. And let's see if I can get this URL right. Basically, Google is going to do what you would do manually by just typing this into math, but it's going to do it automatically for us because it's a waste of time for you to sit there and type a bunch of addresses into math or even copy paste them. So this is the base URL and then we're going to add our own data and we want to, so this is the value of the cell we're in, we want to uh, format this as a URL and basically what that does is it just, it gets rid of the spaces so instead of Lakewood space 10869 uh, we have what the URL means as a format. So this URL is going to go to Google, fetch some information, and then come back to us. It takes a while, so I actually did it already in this other spreadsheet, which is the exact same thing, but the geodata is already there. For this set of 149 rows, I think it took about half an hour. It's, it's not quick. Um, but it's half an hour that you don't have to spend doing anything. Oh no, I left things in here from my practice. Okay, anyway, so what you get is this blob of information. I'm copying it right now because I'm going to show you what it looks like pretty. So this is, it's in the format called JSON, which is just a, a text format. And I just pasted this data into this online JSON viewer. And now it starts to make a little more sense. Like, okay, it went and it broke this address up into a bunch of different components. And it's giving us the county and the state, the country, zip code. It's giving us lot long boxes around this property. It's a lot of useful information. So what we need to do now is we need to parse this out into the format that we want. And you can find something like this just by typing in like JSON viewer into Google and anything that comes up will help you. So well, I want to go back. I was still using that. Okay. So what we want, I think let's pull out the county. So we want from the results, we want to look in the address components array and then we want to find is the zero, first, second, third, fourth element. We want this fourth element of this array. So again, we can add column based on this column, and we're going to parse this, this JSON. So we're taking the value of this Google geocode result, and we're using the Google refine or open refine command parse JSON. And we're finding it from the results. And then we're looking in address, components, this is a good spelling test. We're finding number four, the fourth element. And then we want something called long name. So here there's just long name, short name, and then another array of types. We're just going to choose long name. And in this preview, you can see that here's what we started with and here's what it's going to give us, Jefferson County. That looks pretty good. So we'll call this new column county, and we'll say, okay. And now we have a bunch of counties where once we just had street addresses. That's pretty cool. So we'll do a text facet just to see if we got what we thought we got. Uh, and there are two things that are clearly not what we wanted. So one is just the state, Colorado, not what we want. And two is blank. So the blanks are probably errors or timeout things. We don't have time to get into fixing those now. But the state is pretty easy, so I'll show you that. So we'll copy one of these. When I select the state Colorado, it's showing me only those rows that have um, the value Colorado in county. I'll paste that in here, and let's see. So we pulled from address, or results, 
address components, and then we pull 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's what we told OpenRefine to get us. But we actually want the third element here. So all we're going to do is for these 51 rows, we're going to add another new column. And in our history, we don't even have to retype things. We'll just reuse the same command we used before. But this time we want the third element. And if you look, that's giving us county. Call that county 2. We'll say OK. So these look good. And now, again, this is only affecting these 51 rows that were highlighted. I'm going to replace the value Colorado with whatever the county is, because that's actually what we want. So I'll go county, edit cells, transform. And I want the cells from the column county 2, and I want the value that's inside them. And now in my county column, I have county. That's really nice. So there's still these 31 errors. Um, some of them are, are things that are easy to fix. Others are more problematic. But at the end of the day, you know, you got the bulk of your work done um, with very little effort and a lot of consistency and reproducibility. So I find that using web services, especially for geography cleaning, can be really helpful. OK, move along. So the last thing that I'm going to look at with you is taxonomy. I don't know. So we have all these nice taxon names. And uh, again, we could, we could look at a, a filter to see, or a facet to see what taxon we have in here, tax that we have in here. I'm going to show you a technique for cross-referencing two different data sets. So say you maintain an internal authority because you're an ornithologist and you, like, you know what the newest name for whatever species should be, and you have preferences. Um, I don't. I'm not really an ologist of any kind. So um, I usually look to other people for those resources. But what we're going to do is we're going to take these 68 choices, and we're going to um, we're going to use Jesus because because, like I said, I don't really have a, a bird authority on hand that I care about using. So GBIS has a tool called the Species Lookup. It's under Tools, Species Matching. We want to see if the things that are in our data are actually valid species names. So in the Species Matching tool, we need to have a CSV file. So again, we're going to take a text output of these 68 choices. I copied that. I'm going to paste it into the spreadsheet. We don't need the frequency count. And then we're going to give it a column header called scientific name. And we'll save that. And we'll save it as a CSV. We'll move Adobe Connect so I can actually press the Save button. And then we can upload that to GBIF. So GBIF has lots of you know, issues with the quality of what you're getting when you use it for a taxonomic resource. Um, but it still is a useful, useful thing to have. So I'm going to say, I only give me results for animals, because I know these are all birds. And then I can match this to the GBIF backbone taxonomy. It'll tell me things like if it's a fuzzy match, like there's an extra eye on Cooper eye, or if it's exact, and then the status, if it's accepted, or maybe if it's a synonym. I'm not very zoomed in. This might need to be more zoomed in. So I can look at it on this web portal, but I, I just want to generate a CSV. And leave GBIS. I'm going to go back to OpenRefine, and I'm going to create a new project. using that normalized file that GBIS just gave me. Things look good. I'm going to get rid of that CSV. Create project. So now what we have is we have this data from GBIS where the original name is the names that we gave it, 
And then it's giving us all this extra information, like a full scientific name, how confident it was with its matching algorithm, um, the authors in here, it's giving us higher taxonomy. What we're going to check right now is we're going to look at the status. So I want to know if the bird names in my data are, are valid or if they need to be updated. So to do that, I'm going to, oh no, maybe I'll leave this. Make it small. I'm going to, again, you'll get super used to this. Edit column, add column based on this column. But now we're going to use a function called cell cross. So what this is doing is I'm going to say look at the project called normalized, which has to exist in OpenRefine, and we just made it so it does. And within normalized, look at the original name column, zero element, and then based on that, give me the value of the status column. And so you can see based on Bubo virginiatus, it's accepted. Um, and we've got someone trying to call me, but that's not important. Okay, so we're going to call this Jesus status. And okay. Oh, I guess I already did this. We'll call it Jesus status too. So if I do a text facet on this, we can see that most of my names are accepted, but for five of them, there's a synonym. And for the synonym, we see, oh, we've got Paris and Belli. So that must be a newer name. Uh, there's a newer name that exists for that. So we also have something that's blank. So that means it didn't find it in the original data. So if I want to know what this valid name for this species is, um, we can, again, add another column. Sorry. Edit column. And the way that GBIS formats their data is that this species value here is always the most up-to-date name. So if there's a synonym, the up-to-date name will show up here. So we'll go to our history. We'll do reuse. And instead of status, status we want species. And we're going to preview. And it looks like so most of these are going to match. OK. That looks good. But again, for our synonym, we can see that here's the new updated name for this species. So if I wanted to, I could automatically edit taxon name so that it's up to date. So you can use cross-reference for lots of different things. Basically, um, anytime you want to compare two data sets, Open or Find is one of the best ways, I think, to do it. You can customize what you want to do, and you can. Um, it's really easy and clear to see the results. At Chicago, we had a lot of success. We had transcribed our catalog books, um, and we had a lot of success comparing um, the catalog book data sets to our inventory data sets. And that really helped us clean up and fill in gaps in our inventory data. So this, this cell cross functionality is, like I think, one of the things that I find most helpful about Open or Find. Um, there's a lot more we could talk about, but I think we're going to turn it over to Andy now so we can talk about uh, data cleaning tools in Arctos. And then if we have questions at the end today, um, we, can, we can go back into Open or Find. But for now, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, turn this over to Andy. All right. Uh, that was great, Erica. Uh, there's lots of cool things in there I had no idea you could do. That geography lookup looks really handy, especially. Uh, so I was going to run through some of the tools that are available in Arctos. Um, uh, there's several tools in the reports and services that I think are pretty handy for preparing your data for a big bulk upload. Um, under reports and services, there's data services. Um, the few that I was going to run through today was the taxon name checker, the higher geography lookup. Uh, that kind of complements what uh, Erica was showing us with OpenRefine. If you have some problems in there, you could use this to maybe uh, check on those. Um, I'll just show you this non-print 
um, locator. Uh, the date formatter can be useful for really big data sets. And then finally, some of these agent tools. Um, so let's just jump right in with the taxon name checker. So if you start here, um, there's documentation pages. I definitely suggest you check those out whenever you're getting started. Uh, there's definitions of um, the different uh, column headings that's used. Um, but here it says what's required is the red column. So, Hey, Andy, uh, can you maximize your screen? It's a little small. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So, sorry, um, I've got this list of, of these species names from that same data set that Eric was working on. Um, you can see it's 150 or so of our records. Um, and you can just input this into the name checker and see how Arctos likes all those names. Shoot that in. Takes a few minutes to run through and check it. And then it spits out a CSV for you. Downloads them automatically, and you can see uh, what it thinks about all of these records. Um, you get a status column here. Is accepted is good. Accepted name. Uh, fail is bad. So these ones here, uh, I went in and did a little editing to see what happens when you have bad data in there. Uh, this one didn't come up needs an extra I. You go through and correct these individually in your bulk upload data sheet. Um, it doesn't like SVP. Uh, I don't like that either. So I would figure out what that is, get that in there. Um, the Impinimax SV, uh, that came up as a fail. It doesn't come up as an individual species. However, in the bulk loader, if you do look on If you do look in the taxon um, formulas, um, it does accept a genus with species. Um, so when it's unknown, you can't input that anymore, accept it as a formula. Um, there's a few other problems in here, just misspellings of words, you go through and correct those individually. So you can put them in your bulk loader and once you've had them all fixed, um, that should be ready to go. Just want to note one thing here, um, there's an option in the formula if you're unsure on the exact identification but you have it narrowed down to two, um, you can indicate uh, two possible identifications with or. Um, it also would accept, the bulk order would accept hybrids with, instead of or, it could be an X, and that identifies it as a hybrid species. Uh, so once you've gone through and checked all of those, you can correct them in your bulk loader and then the bulk loader CSV, and those would then be ready to upload. Um, the next tool. I wanted to run through with the higher geography lookup. Uh, there's two options here. The first one being uh, if you have information split out in the different components of geography from higher level continent or ocean to country to state, each one of these would be a separate column in a uh, spreadsheet. Uh, let me show you. So here are those same column headers with this data broken out into continent, country, state, and county. Uh, this is a pretty clean data set. All of our stuff is coming from Colorado, which we work with a lot. We get a lot of salvage animals. So we have this set up to uh, give us the geography in the kind of setup that uh, Arctos wants. So once you have these things set up, you could check and see if Arctos is going to accept all the uh, geographies you have listed, so you can choose your file.
upload the file and it will run it through a checker. I don't think this should take too long. And here are the results and you can see that for each one of these it says found one auto update. Essentially that's saying yep that is in our list of approved higher geographies um, that can be used. Um, if however you have some messier data uh, like this you have just states and counties and maybe random countries. This is the same same sort of table, just uh, not filled out as completely. You can still upload that. You don't need every column filled out. Um, and Arcos will tell you what it thinks. So upload that one. It comes back and here you see it identifies the ones that are giving you problems. Um, so this first one that was just Australia didn't pop up. Um, this one I'm a little confused on because it shows you the options for the uh, continent or ocean and Australia doesn't appear to be a continent in this list. Um, so that's odd, especially since here when I put Australia in as a country, um, it does have the option of Australia as a continent and then as a country. So we'll be looking into that. Um, this record I had just Japan and Okinawa. You've got all these options. You could have Japan, Okinawa, Island, Okinawa, Prefecture, Province, uh, or you could get more specific to the islands. Uh, some of these say found nothing. Uh, Colorado Eads, there's no Eads County. Eads, Eads is a city in Kiowa County that needs to be fixed. Colorado Dane, there's no Dane County in Colorado. Um, so you can use this as a tool to identify problems in your higher geographies. Um, if it doesn't come up, you're going to have to do a little more research. Uh, for these ones, it shows you what options you have. Uh, so it's pretty handy. Unfortunately, the download CSV has not been working for me. I get this error, uh, and we will get that fixed so that you can get a, uh, a CSV file with those possible suggestions, um, or at least errors spit back out at you. Uh, but for now, you can use it to identify the ones that you need to give more attention. Uh, So the second option, option two in higher geography strings, um, that also is not working very well for me. Um, I think the idea there was you could have a single column with all of your geography in it and it would search through it, uh, but uh, either my data was too messy or um, it had it's having some glitch and it was not, it was timing out before it was giving me results. But the first one is pretty handy. Um, take a little time to spread, split things out into these uh, different column headings and you'll get some pretty useful results. The next tool I wanted to show real quickly was this find and replace non-print characters. Um, so if, you, if you're entering a lot of text into your mark boxes, um, Arcos doesn't like line returns in particular. Um, so you can use this tool to identify those and remove those. Um, just as an example, I pulled some text out of the uh, Arctos, Arctos DB website um, and you can put that in there. and. Arctos will do a quick check looking for any non-printing characters um, that it doesn't like, which will hold up your entry. It displays your results in a few different methods. Um, replace with an X, replace it with whatever you type in this box, uh, replace it with nothing, so it just gets rid of spaces, or replace it with a space. Uh, 
could be useful if you aren't doing a lot of text. It's definitely worth trying. Uh, after that, we've got a date formatter. Again, there's two options here. Uh, unfortunately, option one was not uh, cooperating with me yesterday. Um, however, essentially, option one would concatenate by, uh, values. So if you had a file that looks like this with year, month, and day, ideally it would concatenate them into ARCO format. But if you have them in this format, you may as well just do it yourself. And you can concatenate uh, like this. And then you get your everything in that uh, Arcos Proof date format. Um, actually, I'd have to do a little bit more because it likes uh, for two-digit numbers. Um, so that would take a little more work. Um, I'm not going to waste time with that. However, the uh, second option for um, editing date format is kind of handy because it can take things in a lot of different forms. Um, I created this file here, which has just some random dates in different formats, um, numerical formats, and um, both text strings, things like that. So you can just dump this whole thing into this tool here and see what spits out. So it loaded, proceed to validate, it validates, gives you a CSV, which you then open right here. Um, and it shows you what you put in in the first column and then what it should be in the second column. Again, Excel likes to convert things into this format. Um, again, that is not the format that Arctos likes. Uh, so you can quickly change, <coughs> change that format. I use UK format and the year month date format. There you go. So I fixed all of these um, except for this one. It didn't like the 27th in the date. You just have to get rid of those. Um, you could do a quick search of your CSV and remove any of those GHs or NGs or RDs as needed. Uh, so that's a quick way to get your dates in the right format. Then there's a few tools for um, cleaning up your agent names. Uh, this first one, Data Services Agent Name String Formatter. Uh, actually, let's look at the deconcatenator first. Um, so if you have an existing database with multiple collectors in a column uh, just separated by comma, you can get those all split out using this tool. You can choose your file. Sorry, I should show you what that looks like. So here, just to make it quick, four values is a series of names separated by commas. Uh, you upload it, go to this page, you click on parts, and it parses them out. Um, shows you the results here, but then you can click on CSV at the bottom and get this split agent file here. So it shows you your original entry here and then each of the agents split out there. Then you can take these and copy and paste them and make them, put them in a single column, get rid of all this extra stuff, save that. As another CSV, something like this, um, and then you can check and see if this is in the format that Arcos would like. Um, for abbreviated names, if for spaces between letters, uh, I threw in some extra, some special characters here to see how it handled that. Um, so you can then take that file.
go to the data services, go to the name string formatter. Um, again, this tool, it's a tool, it's not metric, so make sure you're checking all your results. Um, but you can put that file in and it will spit out um, things in the format that Arcos wants them. It identifies things that it doesn't know what to do with. Uh, this is a special character, it's an O with an umlaut over it, comment weird character. So get in there and you got to fix that. Um, it added the space between uh, initials here. It split things out into um, initials with periods. If you have a really long list, you can click on get CSV and get a copy of this. So here you can see this is what you guys or this is what I just entered, and then this is what Arcos returned as um, appropriate. Again, these two with the weird characters, you're going to have to figure out what to do with. So um, there's a few more things I could go into. I don't know if we want to cut it there and go on into questions. Good, because then um, the one other tool I really like to use in getting stuff ready, um, once I've got my name formatted, um, I typically bulk load my agent name, especially when I have a really long list, any more than like a dozen. I definitely am going to be using the bulk agent bulk loader, and that's here in these batch tools. Um, you can go to batch tools bulk load agents here. And it brings you here. Um, this, again, you upload a CSV with uh, these different column names. Let me show you an example here. Uh, so here we have um, those column names here. You have your preferred names um, from the data set that Eric was working with earlier. Uh, usually what I do is manipulate them off to the side and then drop them into the columns where I want them. So preferred names would go there. Then you need to split out first, middle, and last name. Um, so I do a little work with that. Um, First, I'll take the column, and I know I have lots of multiples in there, so you can get rid of duplicates. It gets rid of all of those, and then you want to split things out into first, middle, and last names, and it takes a little time to get things in proper columns, and then you can take all these and drop them in the appropriate columns over here. Uh, I've prepared a file, this one here, um, where I have all those agents split out so that we can try and upload them. Um, I know that there's a lot of agents in here that are already in Arcos. Uh, typically, I would go through and I would remove those uh, just because I know our collections manager is in there, um, I'm in there, our curators are in there. So I go and cut those out just to make it go quicker, but um, you can go ahead and upload them and see what comes out. I did this already because it takes a little time, and you'll get some sort of result like this. Um, and it kind of goes through and it checks against Arco's list of approved agent names, people that are already entered, um, and lets you know if there's any conflict. So Don Canfield, he's not in there. there nothing comes up. Uh, that will load as a new agent. Denise Breading, she's in there already. So we're getting fatal error. Um, so I should go in and I would remove her from that, from my uh, list of agents to upload. Jeffrey T. Stevenson, 
Well, he's not in there exactly like that. He's in there with a period. Um, so I would go and fix my database or my uh, bulk load CSV to have the key in there so that it gets the right Jeff Stevenson, David Letterman's in there. Um, and then I just go one by one, um, getting rid of people that are already in there and then editing any uh, weird uh, entries. Uh, this one, Jim Gilman is in there, um, comes up. He could be either James Gilman or Jim I. Gilman. I know because he's one of our comparators, it's Jim I. Gilman, so I'd make sure that's entered right. Uh, and so on, you just go through and one by one, make sure we're not creating duplicate people, people that were in there, and try to make sure you're not signing specimens to the wrong person if they share a similar name. So that's about all I think I need to get into right now, unless anyone has any more specific questions. Well, great. Well, thank you both. That was really great. Um, I haven't explored some of these tools, so I'm excited to, to do that with my data set, and I think many of us. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Let's see. <laughs> um, great. So we have about 10 minutes left for questions, so I'm going to open it up to everyone. For all of you listening, I enabled everyone's microphone, so um, if you like to ask a question, go ahead. Um, you may need to click on that microphone icon at the top bar of your screen and make it green in order to hear you. Um, and you can also ask questions in the chat. Typing. Um, hi, this is uh, this is Carol. I had a couple questions. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So. Um, Two, one question for Erica and one for um, Andy, actually. So one issue, well, I sort of see for both ways of checking taxonomy. I know with Arctis, there's a lot of taxonomy in there, at least for amphibians and reptiles, that says is accepted, but, um, but it's not the most current taxonomy for lizards or snakes or frogs or whatever. So it'll come up when you do a check against Arctos as being an accepted taxonomy, but in reality it isn't. And so... Um, and I, I'm just trying to figure out, like, does anyone have any, I know we can check GBIS, too, and you, I think you'll still run against possibly the same issues. And I didn't know if anybody had any other special taxonomy, like, CSV files that they use. Like, I, I don't know if there is one. Like, for the reptile database, that's what I check for all my taxonomy, but I don't think there's a CSV file for that. So, sorry, that's sort of a complicated question. No, I see what you're saying. I think it's like a complicated question, but a question that everybody needs help with and that lots of people are trying to work on, but there's there's not a great answer yet. Um, because a, what you would want, ideally, is, yes, a CSV of the reptile database. And it might be worth emailing the people that maintain that database and, and ask if that's something they could provide, because it, it should be technically pretty easy on their end. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, GBIS will tell you if a name is um, valid or unaccepted, but, you know, GBIS is not the most trustworthy source. Yeah, and I, I believe, um, and Erica, I think you probably have more experience with Curator, but I think that is a task that Curator does, is check against various authorities, and, and they pull from, you know, IDIS and, and some of you know, like basically throughout all the disciplines. I mean, I, I don't, yeah, I don't believe there's a, um, a herb specific one, but um, that might be something to look into. Yeah, if you're looking for authorities other than just this. And when there's, when there's um, a lot of taxonomy issues for you to be dealing with, um, there, that's a whole other web, webinar on updating and uh, addressing taxonomy issues. Most of the time, it's not, uh, things. I don't know, I'd suggest filing a GitHub issue and seeing if we can resolve, you know, one of two that species names that are confusing in there. Uh, but when it's a whole lot, that's another level of complexity that needs to be worked in. I mean, it's, 
It's really collection by collection. Like we, for example, we recognize MPVO web taxonomy for amphibians, and I might be able to get a CSE for, for that from the shelf. We, if people are interested. But a lot of people use amphibian species of the world, which there's a bunch of differences within the, the bufos, like the frogs and the toads, especially. And um, and so the issue really comes down to like what, like for me, when I catalog something, I do, I actually catalog it as the most current taxonomy that we want to accept. And then at some point, I'm going to have to go in and change all my old stuff, which is a little bit weird. I know most people don't catalog that way. So. Um, with the idea that at some point I'm going to fix all my frogs and my snakes and lizards to sort of match this. Um, but, I mean, it's very, I mean, there, for reptiles and amphibians, I mean, there isn't really, everybody doesn't agree at all. And so, and I know with, with like, GBIF, they're going to have multiple yeah. sources of taxonomy, like for lithobates versus rana or something like that, I know. It's, it's more than a GitHub issue, for sure. No, it's just a community yeah. issue, too, and I think... I mean, I, think, I know Phyllis at DMNS has been dealing with this with mollusks as well, and it, it seems like the sort of thing that, like, our just as a community, kind of like we've been doing with geography, should discuss in more detail, because we should be able to maintain some level of these preferences within Arctos as well. I agree. Um, we have a chat question from Diego from U of M. Um, can anyone access the Arctos tools simply by creating an account or on the portal? We specify at U of M, but I'd like to try validating my data using these tools before I import it. Um. I, do you know, Andy? I, I think that you would have to have an account with, I think you would have to be associated with a collection that uses Arctos as their collection management system in order to access the data cleaning tools. Yeah, I think that's correct, uh, but I haven't tried to do any of this without... As, as in all... Sorry, Andy, go ahead. No, I just, I agree. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can do it without having a, you know, an account tied to a collection. I, I will say for Diego, um, that link that starts with GitHub that I posted earlier in the chat um, to a webinar on Curator, Curator will do a lot of the same things that Andy just showed you in Arctos. Um, Curator is, is basically like the data cleaning steps that VertNet helps you do but made accessible to the public. Um, so it, that might be something for you to check out as um, that webinar or just looking up Curator. And then for Aaron, I don't totally understand what your question is. Yeah, and for Andy, I don't know if you can that. Um, can Arctos identify duplicates across collection, collections within Arctos? Yeah, and I'm not quite sure if that referring to taxonomy, like across disciplines that share the same uh, genera. Well, Aaron's responding, I'll make a point that like, one thing that uh, we found at, when I was working at the Chicago Academy about Arctos is that it's, it's just such a helpful community that if, if you're ever doing something that's monotonous, it's worth just asking other people how they do that same thing because there's a really good chance that somebody else has figured out a, a less monotonous and better way to do it. And everybody in Arctos is very helpful. Okay, Aaron, yes, Aaron has clarified. So, for example, if our collection has a specimen and there is a duplicate specimen from another collection within Arctos, would you be able to link those specimens together? So if you're talking like, like we have some chipmunks that were collected on a collecting trip with multiple institutions, and we got the skins from, from the chipmunks, but um, the other institution got uh, tissue samples that they are storing. Yes, those can be linked across collections if they're both in Arctos. Um, yep, and Aaron, you'd do that um, through what's called relationships. And yes, that can be, you know, 
the same individual um, that's been maybe exchanged or different parts are at different institutions or you know, host parasite um, or parent offspring. There's, there's all sorts of um, same lot, all sorts of uh, different options. Oh, any more questions? We've got two more minutes. Um, I will take this opportunity to um, link again to that I think bio post webinar survey. Um, again, it's really super quick to fill out um, and let's just continue to use this form provided by IDIG Bio and um, not have our participants need to pre-register in advance and um, also help IDIG Bio with their number of funding. So please, please, please take a moment to fill that out for us. I was just going to see if I could find an example of that cross-linked issues. Um. Carol, that it looks like the reptile database does have data that you can download, but that they only do it sporadically. So maybe that's helpful. Again, very helpful. Yeah, that was that was great, both of you. Um, <coughs> I will be sure to be using a lot of these web services in the future. So thank you guys both so much. That was great. All right. Thanks, Emily and Andy. Yeah. Thanks for everyone who showed up. And Teresa.